I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I found myself in comedy, almost. I realized the one thing I wasn't comfortable with in acting because I was new to it was auditioning. I was never taught that in acting school. So I I went on every audition I could, every possible audition, things that I just wasn't right for. What did you learn about auditioning that was different from what you learned about acting? It's this weird thing where you kind of have to go in there with the attitude that you don't want it, that you don't need it, or or at least make it less important to you somehow. All right, we got Payne is in the building. Rob Corddry from Ballers, my yep. one of my favorite HBO shows. I have to say one of because I love all of HBO shows. Yeah, they don't make a they make pretty good shows. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do. But but I've been watching Ballers since the start. It's um, just to quickly I'm going to just quickly describe that and describe your background, and then we'll get into the weeds of it. Ballers is about to do uh, their newest season, season four, which I've been watching is awesome. Uh, uh, and by the way, Rob. Every few months, it's like I always, you know, HBO Go, I, I always check Ballers. Is the new season out? Is the new season out? Now, finally, I've been able to watch the new season preparing yeah. for this. It's like Christmas. Yes, it is. It's, I've it's been like waiting for it Christmas. forever. Because I feel like the distance between either one and two or two and three was shorter. So I'm always like expecting it to just like come I, out the next day. I think it was. It was shorter. It was like a month. Uh, it's a month longer this this time around. I think. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, I guess the best way to describe it is like, Entourage meets sports management, um, just in the sense that HBO, it's like this classic HBO genre of going behind the scenes of a real world industry with real world people and bringing in fictional characters to sort of dominate it. Like Entourage, that's right. like behind the scenes of a real Hollywood yeah. uh, movie star. Larry Sanders show, uh, which yes. John, where John Stewart, we'll get to him in a second, <laughs> um, had a major part in. The Larry Sanders show was sort of behind the scenes of a, a talk mm-hmm. show and was just brilliant with, with Gary Shandling. Um, so you've also done some of my favorite movies, particularly uh, Hot Tub Time Machine, <laughs> which was just insane. It was like insanely good, given the premise. It was a lot of it was uh, anarchy, you know, in a way, a- a comedy of anarchy. And you told me the guy was just like riffing on that as a joke, or you, you said in an interview the guy was just riffing on that in, in a joke, and then just made the the, the script for fun of the. Fun it, had, of it. it had been like a running joke of theirs since high school. A hot tub time machine, and then they thought, "Let's write this movie. Let's let's you know." And uh, 
It was, yeah, kind of like a joke on Hollywood. How did they pitch that? I don't know. You know, it's probably one of those things where they went in so with in something else. <laughs> they went in with something else and they were like, ah, we don't want that. What else you got? And then you have to just come up with something. And Hot Tub Time Machine was just uh, there. All right, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I want to get to the ballers. Think? But when you were auditioning for Hot Tub Time Machine, <laughs> what did they have you do? Like, how did you, you, you fit a very specific role in that movie and you were brilliant. But like, what did you, You're right. I how can't did you even, get that role? I didn't, uh, I did not have to audition for that. That was like the first movie I ever just got an offer for, um, which was a great like uh, corner turning in in a in a career. But like, I have no idea what that audition would have been. You know, like just to, like they throw a bunch of curse words into uh, onto the the floor and just see what you do with them. Well, it's interesting that 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 you say that you didn't audition for that one because I I will. On the Daily Show, so you were a, a correspond, quote unquote correspondent on the Daily Show for for four or five years, two thousand two mm-hmm. to two thousand six, and I think and that, I think you sort of built up this personality <laughs> as a, a likable jerk, right, right, right. <laughs> and so I guess that's what and and you had that on steroids in Hot Tub Time Machine. That's right. That's right. So I, I, I guess they must have just like pictured you. Like who else could who else would you have cast for that role? It, oh my God! For for my role, yeah. Um, well, I think Rob Hubel could have done it. You know, I Rob. Know, I don't know. You do. You've seen him in in everything. Uh, he's got this great show that you should watch the second this is over, called "Do You Want to See a Dead Body?" Uh, and the whole uh, premise I'm is I'm not going to forget that title. <laughs> no, his whole premise is a celebrity. He runs into a celebrity playing themselves, and he says, uh, "What are you up to? Hey, you want to hang out? No? Do you want to see a dead body?" <laughs> and they just go on this journey to see a dead body. It's 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 hilarious, but. We play very similar characters, you know the the kind of, um, you know the guy that is is should be very unlikable, but there's something likable about them. Well, because it makes me think in Ballers, like when I first first off, you you, you season one, everybody t- turns it on because it's it's HBO and and The Rock is doing this serious for him. It's a serious it's a, yeah. role. He's not it's playing like. A kindergarten teacher with a baby or anything like he's. That's right. This is like he's a a, a former all pro uh, football player down on his luck who you recruit basically to monetize his his sports relationships yeah. and you you together throughout throughout the arc of the series get more more and more heavily invested in the in in the sports management industry. Yeah, he's basically um, I. Uh, I, my character, at least season one, just really wanted to be part of that world. He's a big sports fan, and this was just his way in. He's like, I'm going to hire this dude who I know is smart, and then I'll I'll be an athlete too, <laughs> in, in, a, in a way. But you know, that it's funny you say that because we were talking earlier, and I said I love the show, and you you were mentioning how Senator Senator uh, Elizabeth yeah, Warren, right. the good senator the from Massachusetts, yeah, and how it's weird the demographic is like all yeah. over the place for the show. But I find the show, even though. It's a sitcom. I laugh. I'm and the story, it, the writing's great. I'm intrigued with this. There's always good <clears throat> arcs for each uh, season. Great arcs for each season. I find the show to be oddly aspirational. Like I watch an episode and I'll just go do push-ups afterwards. <laughs> I, I don't know I why. Did. Like like everything about the show, I feel like I want to do that jump from the opening credits where the yeah, guy. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, I could yeah. do it. If they could do it on a sitcom, I could do it. Yeah, it's a pretty satisfying show, I guess. You know, like I was saying before, it's a, it's not a head scratcher. You don't have to do a lot of work. Um, and, uh, you know, it's definitely just a show you can tune out to it, but it's also, you know, there, you can engage yourself as well. It's, uh, it's one of the most fun times I've ever had, uh, doing this job. You guys look like you're having so much yeah. fun. And this is also, we're going to get it again. Um, um, we're going to get into the arc of things. Yeah. Just, but these are just bullet points. <laughs> this is, this is, I feel like this is one of the main, the biggest roles you've had where you're just a performer, uh, as opposed to being involved in the writing and yes. so on. And so, because you, you've, you, you know, we didn't mention you, you, you've done like a, I don't know how many seasons, seven seasons of Children's Hospital That's right, on yeah. uh, Adult Swim, yeah, which is just an insane parody of a children's hospital. Oh. Even the title I should mention is spelled without apostrophe s. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I hate you, it when that's misspelled with the apostrophe. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you even think of that? Um. We just thought that there, yeah, at, at first it wasn't even a children's hospital. Like it was just named after the Arthur Children's, the founder. Um, 
I think it was just a quick joke. It was just, you know, the 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 quickest, funniest joke we had in the moment. And and uh and it stuck. A lot of like the Brazil, you know, that that Children's Hospital was oh, ostensibly yeah, set in right. Brazil, which they would always go back to like that. Of course, Brazil, which is where we are. This <laughs> hospital is in Brazil. Well, that was a one-off <laughs> improvised joke that David Wayne just gave um, Megan Mullally to say, and it's become our our only mythology that 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 is stuck. Well, uh, it, it, it's <clears throat> funny because um, it, inside the hospital basically everybody looks American, like US. That's right, that's right. And then suddenly they walk outside and yep. everything's like, like people straight out of Mardi Gras are like that's walking right. around. And, yeah. uh, and, and we actually whole... went to Brazil once. We went to Rio. Really? To and film it? shot 15 seconds that we didn't even need. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had already edited uh, the, the whole episode and we cut 30 seconds worth of valuable story material just so we could use this 50 seconds in, in Brazil. That, Which you no, know, everybody thought was a green screen anyway. It doesn't matter. Boy, when they're walking around like Brazil, that's just a set. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it kind of the joke is I think you're fooling your brain fools yourself into thinking it looks like Brazil because we made no effort except that one 15 second uh, period to to make it look like Brazil at all. Like, and, and you you've once said that um, so so you basically created and and wrote a lot of it, and you basically once said you got uh, all your friends to be in it. Yeah. And it just goes to show you when you're when you surround yourself with the people you want to work with, great things happen. This is like a yes. hilarious. I, I, how much of it is like improv and how much of it is scripted? Um, yeah, it's funny. You know, it's I, I love it when people ask me that because it means there is that there is a loose quality to it that that we were definitely going for. But it's very tightly scripted, if uh, if you can believe that. We we used to bang our heads against desks writing that thing and. But then, when on the day of shooting, you're you're working with some of the greatest improvisers around, so it would be dumb not to let them, you know, riff. So, so this is all on a tangent off ballers, but I still want to ask about Children's Hospital. There is a huge um, minute to joke, or maybe a huge yeah, yeah, joke yeah. to minute ratio. Yeah. Getting my math right, just ha- you know, and there are eleven to twelve minute shows or fifteen yep. minute shows. Just what are you? I, I kind of want to get into the, and I know this is hard, but I kind of want to get into just what is the the structure of a joke when you're when you're when you're writing a show like that. And um, I, that maybe that's a dumb question. No, it's I don't know if there is a particular structure. I would say, however, that the 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 one through line would be that no matter what you're saying, it it's with you're you're on a drama. That like fifth, that Children's Hospital in the mythology was the longest running hospital drama ever, and. <laughs> And that just from play it like it's a you know it's it's always played without a wink, um, and and it's the most that's the highest stakes, uh, most important thing. It, it sort of makes me think of um, what the what the Eric Andre show is to late yeah. night yeah. Uh, children's yeah. hospital is to like hospital dramas, which is basically you keep the entire structure mm-hmm. uh, of what that genre is, yeah. but you change one element, and that's what, that's, right. that's where all the humor is created. That's right. Yeah. And so like Eric Andre. It's totally every aspect. Explain of that it, show to me, because that's one of those that you watch. I love that show, but it's one of the, I I get nervous almost watching it sometimes because you I don't get, know when he's gonna like no, go crazy. No, I get I get afraid for the people. I don't whether they're in on it or not. Like I get afraid. I get afraid for myself. I but I love that. But love, Children's Hospital is like that. Like <laughs> when's yeah, the baby so. gonna die? Like you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. For you know, so so like so Eric Andre's show. Every element you would think is normally in a late night show is there, mm-hmm. except. Eric Andre is roughly uh, a, a temp worker who doesn't know what he's doing. You know, yeah. this is the way I think <laughs> of it. That's right. That's right. That's good. And that's and, the talk show. And whoever is editing it, I know they do it very much on purpose. That the weird editing style, but um, I like to imagine that that's the first time they've sat down at an editing editing bay. <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, the editing is brilliant because they could take any point and say Just coming right back, it. and they never come back to that. And it's point. wrong. It's always wrong. They're always cutting to the wrong thing, right. which is so right. I don't know how they do it. Um, so it's a very different show, but it is very similar too. Yeah, in that it, it is a uh, takes a genre, yeah, it takes one a genre. element, yeah. And yeah. and the element you basically change is that it's a drama. There's dramatic story points. Yeah. you know, typical to like ER or any mm-hmm. you know ho- classic hospital or medical drama. And then I guess the element you change is that essentially it's a parody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we started off being more of a parody. Like the first season or two 
was more of strictly a, a parody of hospital shows, but we kind of ran out because it wasn't. It, it became less satisfying to parody hospital shows, um, but rather keep that framework. And we ended up being sort of um, like paying homages almost to to different genres of movies and TV. Like we would always do action. We love doing action and science fiction and. Um, uh, you know, we 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 subtly send up things like um, "Do the Right Thing," one of my favorite episodes. You know, um, called "Is It Hot Enough for You?" Uh, I I don't know that one. What did you do? It's in that one? um, it's basically there's just jazz playing through the whole thing, and it's very steamy. And it's because it's the hottest day of the year, chaos erupts. Uh. And when chaos finally erupts, it means like there is just chaos in the emergency room. There's at one point. In the background, the very deep background, you see a Chinese dragon, <laughs> like a parade uh-huh. dragon. Um, and uh, I believe I get killed for the first or second time to my character. So so l- let me ask you a question because I'm still, um, I want to understand exactly like parody. Like I remember one episode of ER I saw where it was very sad, like someone was hurt or they had a disease and they had one hour left before they became completely paralyzed. So whoever, whatever loved one <laughs> needed to talk to them needed to get in there in that one hour and it was a tearjerker yeah. at, the, at the end because they finally went paralyzed. So like, how would you parody that? How would you this? parody that? Um, I think probably uh, the doctors would do all they can to like speed the par- paralysis along so they could just go home or uh-huh. like they they just hated waiting. <laughs> you know, the they knew they were going to stop it so like, you know, they'd probably um I don't know. Uh, but like how would you turn up the AC in this room and like So 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 just going along with that, like y- you still can't make them seem evil because part of it is is that they're a little clueless. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're not yeah. in a dramatic... They're self-absorbed, really. Right. Yeah. So how would you make it seem that they're not evil as opposed to just being clueless? I guess, you know, they'd hold the person's hand and they would very seriously say like, and, and remember, we're not trying to get you make you paralyzed. Okay? That's like, funny. well, I didn't think you were. What? Where? <laughs> Are you trying to make me paralyzed? Um, so that would, yeah. I mean, off the top of my head, that would be the... The take. So, so and I, and again, I well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the first tangent, but then I have another angle on Children's Hospital. So, uh, ballers, you're turning on season one. Most people are turning on, I would say, because of The Rock, yep. and this is being his first real series. And you know, the idea of sports management. So, so many people are into sports. It's a sitcom. It's coming from the Entourage group. They got the guys who produced that. So, there's a lot of reasons to to watch it. And you're you come on the screen and at very at, in the very first few moments you're there or the first episode I'm trying to figure out is this guy supposed to be likable <laughs> or is he just like a jerk to everyone and of course you it, there's a nice playoff with your boss there is even you know a super like a legitimate jerk you know most right right and um but but then you realize oh He's he's doing it in this real he's playing this jerk, but in this super laid back way that actually makes the character extremely likable. And I think that's your style. I think he's sympathetic. Like uh I I I have I can't play a character if I don't have sympathy for them. Mm-hmm. And I think Joe is just very endearing in a way of how um kind of clueless he can be and and how wide eyed he is sometimes in this world. He loves loves being part of things. I don't I think like if if I were to uh Write a biography, biography, character biography for him. Uh, he probably was not like one of the cool kids in high school, and he's just always wants to be part of the gang. And then when he's invited, he says the wrong thing. And, and, but the good thing is, he rolls with it in the sense yeah. that he doesn't take it too seriously. It doesn't they're ruin all, his life. They're all making fun of him on everything exactly. he says. Exactly. And, but that's why they like him. Yeah. It's because he just sort of rolls with it. All the yeah. athletes, you know, super athletes, and and so on. Yeah. Well, I I like playing those characters because. I'm from Boston, and it seemed like I had, you know, three different groups of friends I had. There was always that one guy who was, you know, to quote Hot Tub, uh, he's an asshole, but he's our asshole, you know? And and I had a lot of friends that were like, just, you, they, they're they a lot, they're a handful, but you can't do anything without them. They're, they're a lot of fun too. Well, and, and, you know, then the... I think in this upcoming season, this latest season, this is the most personal for the Joe Joe Crutel character that you play. 
you know, he there's a lot of revelation about him in this mm-hmm. latest season. <laughs> uh, what, yeah. what was the conscious decision to say, hey, let's let's open up the books a little on Joe's biography? Um, I don't know. You know, it took them a while. They told me uh, about, you know, Joe has this sort of, did he or did he not murder his wife, <laughs> perhaps, uh, right. thing that gets a little more explored this, uh, this season. They told me at my meeting, my first meeting with Steve Levinson uh, to do the show, and... So it's definitely been a slow burn, which I think is something they're very good at. Like it's just dangling a tiny little carrot. Like, oh, you remember this wife thing? Yeah, here's a little bit more. Um, but I think uh, I don't know really. I just think they enjoy uh, Dwayne and my Dwayne's and my characters' interaction. Yeah, you guys have a a lot of chemistry in we part have a good because rapport, yeah. he trusts you, and then you go to trust him as more than just a football player you're trying to monetize. Yeah, well, he, at first I was his boss the first season. Right. And, you know, I watched that season and it it seems so wrong to me because Joe, it, seemed, it seems more appropriate to his character that he would be, he prefers to be the guy behind the guy, the subservient one, the the one he's, he's very loyal and like, I will back you. That's literally, I think I say this every season. I am, I disagree with you. But I'm gonna back you on this one, you know. And then, in, well, in season four, there's a moment where, of course, he backs you. Yeah, it's big. It's and it's different. tricky. It's really different. The, like Joe really pushes it. A huge, a huge vent- venture that that Spencer Dwayne's character wants nothing to do with, and uh, and and Joe doesn't really let it go until they get it. And then, of course, you know, things all, happen. Things happen. <laughs> Chaos happens. And yeah. then, and then maybe that's why to balance that off. They 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 make it much more personal for you, you know, to kind of give your motivations. I think so. Like if you're spending more time with a character and 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 that character has more agency, then yeah, you kind of have to open the books on the character a little bit more, or it's just you know built on a foundation of sand. And then and then and you know uh, I mentioned earlier I'm not I know zero about sports. Mm-hmm. I I don't even know the rules to football. There's a lot of football in this, <laughs> um, but I love it and the show. As you know, has a lot about reinvention. Every every season, I feel yeah. the characters are reinventing themselves in a very realistic way, in a growth way, and yeah. um, that happens a lot in this last season. But you know, how do you see, you know, Dwayne Johnson, the The Rock, like he kind of grows a lot through the series. Um, it's yeah, not, it's not just about him. The series, of course, but I think his arc is what is what draws the initial viewers in. But it's also, it is also the main A story. You know, it, it's the main story. Um, and he, I think he's just a really interesting character in that um, he, he's uh, the, he has the best intentions, like really honorable intentions for the most part, but he also has a ton of problems. Um, and so he's always complicating things by, by making business personal um, and doing things for the wrong reasons, but then in the end, usually making it right again in some so, grand way. So if you were like, so just from a writing perspective, mm. if you were to say, okay, take that, <laughs> Steve Cohen, our podcast producer, making a guest appearance. Sorry, Rob, sorry. From a from a writing perspective, I mean, it almost seems very classically written. Like it almost like every mm. s- season. Feels like oh of course they're gonna do this yeah and, yeah um, like it feels not like that it's easy to write but that you and Dwayne Johnson give them stuff to work with I think that's definitely the case they they have told me a, a bunch of the writers that they love writing for us um, but but I don't know like you said before like this is this is the first show I've done in a while where I haven't had anything to do with the the writing or producing and that was very much on purpose you know I know I could have gone to them. Uh, early on and said, hey, I'd like to come in the writer's room and maybe uh, write an episode someday or direct one or whatever. And and I held myself back because I I, I wanted this show to just be this. Just but, I just want to act. But they could you could tell they are writing for your voice. Like so for I've sure, yeah. you know, I've watched you a lot of your stuff and and I even watched when you were on Ari Shafir's uh show and you were t- doing the uh, six minute story about uh-huh. your fence. And yeah. that was your character, you know I think it's a little different, but you ha- they're writing for your voice. They know your voice mm-hmm. and, and your personality and your, your comic personality. Mm-hmm. So you could tell, that, that, did you audition for this role or they just called you? Which one? Which one? Ballers. 
I know they just called me. Yeah, uh, I had. I guess my audition was the meeting. Uh, I had met with Steve Levinson, the creator, um, and his dad was there. His dad, who I've come to know as Papa Dave, uh, he's a, he's a producer on the show. Produces everything, co-produces whatever uh, of his son Steve Levinson's uh, stuff. But um, he he's this old you know New York guy, and he he looked me up and down, sort of, and he whispered something to to, to Lev, his son, and then he went, went to the bar, mm. and we had our meeting. And I heard later on, like everybody goes through Papa Dave, mm. you know, he just. He has a he has a way of knowing if it's right or wrong, and then and Steve really like, I, I, you know, puts a lot of uh, gives that a lot of weight. But um, my my we just talked about fantasy football the whole meeting me and Steve and and, and it was uh, you know that 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 I think got me the gig and they started writing that into my character too that, um, I knew enough about football but I knew a lot about f- fantasy football which is. Basically, like Dungeons and Dragons for sports, and and you play fantasy football in I real do. life, I guess. I do. Yeah. You still do? Oh yeah. I'm Are in people like three leagues? Oh man, Joe from Ballers is on our fantasy team. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're so psyched about that. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, all these teams are based in LA, so like, it. I don't think that's a big deal. <laughs> so, so I don't even know if they know I'm on Ballers. That that's funny. They must they must watch it. It's like the. Probably there's yeah, not that know. many sport great sports sitcoms yeah. out there. I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't even. I don't. My brother's the biggest sports fan I know, and and he's an actor as well. I don't know if he watches it. We've never mentioned it. We've never talked about it. That's so funny. Why do you think? I don't, we have better things to talk about. I guess you know we talk about life and stuff. <laughs> well, neither of your careers. <laughs> hardly ever. Hardly ever. Like if there's something big, you know, like boy, this has really given me a hard time. Well. We're very good friends. We're like best friends. We will talk it out and help each other because we have a similar language. We both understand the the business and we're family. So it's a he's a good support. But I have no idea, no idea if he watches ballers. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care 
that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance. Before Ball, many years before Ballers, uh, kind of the start of your name getting out there and the, the country knowing who you were. You were on the Daily Show with John Stewart. Mm-hmm. You were a correspondent. All your pieces were were so funny. What was that process like? Were you um, were, were you always kind of doing sketches? Were you ever doing like joke writing for them, or what was? What yeah. Was the story? Well, yeah. The thing is, um, you know, it's funny. Like right after I left, like when Ed Helms and I had left the show, they finally made the correspondence writers because we were writing the field pieces where we'd go out and interview people with a producer. So so th- that stuff we were writing. Um, the stuff in the studio, no. I mean, that's very st- strictly the writer's room. And then John rewrites the whole show after no. rehearsal for the most part, yeah. So so what happens? There's um, You get there in the morning, yeah, 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 yeah. You 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 saunter in, uh, you know, before lunch, hopefully, um, <clears throat> unless you have something to do that day and you you have a, like a call time. But um, yeah, usually I'd get there at about ten or eleven. Um, and uh, if you're working on a piece, you'd work on the piece, whether that be writing it, um, you know, writing an outline, having meetings to to pitch jokes for it, um, or getting ready to go out and do it. 
you know, or even just finding these things. I would spend a lot of time, you know, it was the only time I've ever read USA Today religiously. Um, you, that's the paper, right? USA yeah. Today, <laughs> the, the hotel paper. Yeah. Um, they have this great section where it's like every state in the country and there'll oh, just yeah. be this little quirky story. That I found a lot of material that way. And then you would write it up for the man on the street stuff? I would or? just pitch it. No, no, no. Yeah, oh, yeah. I would or, just or pitch it. And, and if John, every, anybody on the show, right down to the, the, the newest PA or intern, could pitch story ideas to John. And then John would select a handful of them and, and they'd assign them. And so, like, I, like one that I saw, I mean, I like them all. The one I saw, uh, your, John says, we're going to check out, you know, we have, we have Rob Corddry checking out modern TV. And you analyze how the last trend was all the kind of reality slash gay shows like Queer Eye and, mm -hmm. and all this. And then, and then you start analyzing the ones where the reality shows where people were born rich. So uh, I, I don't even remember. That was a hilarious. It rings a bell. <laughs> it was a hilarious one. And what I like about that is, is your, I guess this is how you would define satire is that you're taking them very seriously. Like these are very serious trends. Yes, yes. And you're you're making conclusions that are funny, but you're yeah. taking it seriously. Yeah, very much so. And I so, love doing that. So the are the writers how much how much because it still has a very improv feel and it has your co comedic talents. How much is it the writers? How much of it's you? Well, on the day when you're interviewing somebody, you know, you're when we were doing, we only had we were sitting there for like five or six hours interviewing these people, and we would get as much material as possible, knowing that ninety percent of the time the story we went in there hoping to get was not the story we came out with. So there was a lot of improv um, on the day during those, during those interviews. And it was it, it, sometimes very tense, you know, because the producer behind the camera would toss out some lines as well. And you could see the interview subject start to get it, you know, because you can't imagine what The Daily Show's take on an issue is going to be or, or a subject, or this person's real life. And when they do get it, there's a moment of panic where they're like, oh, what have I done? And then a moment of panic on my end, like, oh, God, he's going to run. He's going to run. I got to get him back. But um, how many years of improv were you doing before you felt you got you had the skills to do something like that, like the oh Daily God, Show? Oh, God, man. Because you, you, you did a lot of improv f from your beginning years in New York City in the 90s with, yeah. with UCB at the Albright Citizens Brigade. Well, I started out in New York like uh, considering my, fancying myself a very important Shakespearean actor. Like I was doing off, off, off Broadway Shakespeare, crappy, crappy Shakespeare. And um, I, you know, I was touring with the National Shakespeare Company, which sounds a lot better than it is. And... Um, we uh, and then I just I went this my process was I found myself in comedy almost because I realized on one hand I was doing Shakespeare which has this lofty sort of um, feel to it and yet I was playing jackasses I would always play the guy that falls over and you know the fool um, and then I I realized the one thing I wasn't comfortable with uh, in in acting because I was new to it was auditioning. I was never taught that in, in school, in acting school. So I, I went on every audition I could, every possible audition, things that I just wasn't right for. Um, and, and then I started getting better and booking things. What did you learn about auditioning that was different from what you learned about acting? Oh, well, what, you know, one of the things is like, this is it's such an unnatural thing uh, to, 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 to expect, for someone to expect a, a fully developed, you know, well thought out performance um, based on you know five minutes of of material that you may or may not have memorized, um, but that's what you would sort of have to trick them into thinking that. So I think you you I've learned you make a lot of very concentrated choices, um, big choices that you may not necessarily want to do when you're actually shooting it or or doing it on stage. But things that will uh, uh, catch catch an eye in, in an audition and and, and get attention, like so, what? Like what's an example? Oh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> all right. So I used to um, I used to. Uh, this is one where it kind of went south, but uh, in a funny way, I used to audition for commercials a lot. I used to do a ton of commercials when I was first starting out, and I did a. I was in an audition for an Aflac commercial, and I walked in there. You know the duck, the, the insurance duck, and. Um, 
the whole bit was I had to walk up a, a mountain and this duck was following me, you know, saying Aflac. And so I had a, they gave me a backpack and it was, they actually weighted it down. So it was a heavy backpack and I was climbing the mountain. And of course you have to like sort of mime that you're climbing a mountain. And I got to the top and I made a choice. It, it wasn't in the script, but I was so frustrated with this duck that I took my backpack off and I th threw it off the mountain. And there was about 20 people in this room. And the second it left my hand, everybody in the room went, no, 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 no. And it, it hit the floor with this audible crack. And I, and I started to smile. <laughs> I was like, what was in that bag? And the writer, the writer right next to me went, that was my laptop, my new laptop. Oh my God. And I was like, oh man. All you right, think. see you guys on set. <laughs> They should have hired you after that, though. That was another thing I learned about auditioning was that you just got to have a good sense of humor about it, and like, you 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 almost it's it's this weird thing where you kind of have to go in there with the attitude that you don't want it, that you don't need it, or or at least make it less important to you somehow. Because they'll sense it. Yeah, it's if you're scared. Yeah, it's hard to yeah exactly. It's it's also just hard. It's a hard thing to learn. It used to be that I would convince myself I didn't want it, um, but now I can just. You know, after a while, you you just get more comfortable with it, and it's uh, now I find them very fun. Is, is that almost like the segue into improv? Because with mm -hmm. improv, I imagine you're going into a sketch and you have to fully be there. You mm -hmm. can't think of how the audience is responding to you. Well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, you can't help but think about how the audience is responding because, especially in comedy improv, like the laughter is is oxygen. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, you know when you're on the right track and on the wrong track or on the wrong track based on the audience's reaction. But um, yeah, the, the, the improv was a, an exercise in listening. It was a very good life uh, exercise as, as a matter of fact. Like I think I listen better in life, like I'm a better husband because of improv. That's interesting because it's like, like let's say you're, Wife says something. Does your brain suddenly branch it? Okay, I have twelve choices here. <laughs> yeah. One's going to be funny. One's going to piss her off. Yes, you yes, yeah. I uh, just yes and. That's uh -huh. what you do. Yes and. Rule number one of improv. Yes, honey, and. Um, and then what's the second rule? Um, what do you mean? I always what's see the, yes and as the first rule. What's the second rule? Oh, the second rule is uh, never kill your scene partner. Huh. I think, uh, which you always do. You always kill him because it's funny. <laughs> and um, the third rule is my favorite. This one was taught to me by Matt Walsh um, of the Upright Citizens Brigade. He was my second level, third level teacher. And this, I think, is the secret to their success and also something I've just tried to do in my life outside of acting as well, which is um, your main job is to make, don't worry about yourself, make your scene partner look good. Hmm. And if you do that right, you will look good by default. So it kind of, um, it gets you out of your head in a way. Like you don't have to worry about, it, it, it makes you less self-conscious and more keyed into the person you're you're improvising with. That's interesting. So so I could see that working in many areas of mm -hmm. life from yeah. relationships to business to even acting mm -hmm. um, where you're very generous to Dwayne Johnson on the, you could see it on the on the set. What about if you were doing stand-up, which you've, you've I've seen you do it at least once, but you, you've probably done it more than that. Like stand up, where you're the only person on the stage. Yeah, I do. I've done. Uh, I call it fake stand up. You know, like if I do a corporate gig where I've got to go out and do five minutes of local material for a for a business convention or something. It's almost like I know, I know the you know the the the, the, the I know what to do. I know the 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 act of doing stand up, and I know how to write a joke, but I. Don't think I could sustain that for too long um, unless I threw my whole life into it because I feel like stand-up is something, you know, celebrities sometimes will start doing stand-up um, and they'll just immediately like start bumping people at clubs. You know, they'll, they'll bump people who like, they just dedicate their lives to this thing. Um, and I always thought like stand-up is one of the, true art forms of comedy in that it's, um, at least personally, I would have to give it my entire life. And the most successful comedians are the ones that 
they they just throw their their whole uh, soul into it, you know. Um, so I would never denigrate it by <laughs> doing anything more than five minutes of fake stand up. Well, the 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 one time I saw you on Ari Shafir's, I mean, you did a hilarious job as a storytelling stand up, which well, is a style. He, yeah, he's a, a very good of, coach too. Yeah, he was very good. He's very funny. He's a very funny guy, and and gave me a lot of like pointers, you know, like maybe things to you know stand back on, things to hit harder. Um, that was really fun to do, and that that's a true story. Uh, you know what? What? Uh, gosh, that's so. I just got the the rap message, but there's so many things I want to ask. So let me let me narrow it. Down. We're doing a double one. <laughs> yep, we're going around again. When you, I, I have to jump to to 2006. You leave the Daily Show. You're on six. <laughs> you're in a pilot called The Winners, yeah, which is which, the worst name for a show. You're asking for trouble, right? They're not winners. <laughs> That's winners, the first response anyone's more like ask. losers. <laughs> and it, it's of course canceled after six episodes, yeah. and then. It seems like these are your dark years from 2006, yeah. 2007, maybe a little 2008. Yeah. Like the writer strike happened. Yeah, too. so yeah. so now that it's 12 years later or 10 years later, we all just see it as a list of IMDb credits. But what were you going through in those years? Like were you worried oh like God. it's a financial crisis also like were you worried yeah. you weren't going to get a job? Yes. <laughs> what happened? How did you survive this? I thought maybe it was over. I was making no money. Uh, it was the writer strike, so there wasn't even a chance to get a job at that point. Um, there was. Uh, I just moved to a a, a a city that I didn't know or understand with a new family, like my, my with a two month old daughter, and so it was a very very stressful time. And what I did was because I didn't have anything to do, was that I spent eight hours a day learning how to be productive. So I was, I was productive for eight hours, learning productivity. Doing what? Did, what were you doing? Were you a lot on? of different things? But mo, mo, mostly, I landed on this thing called GTD, uh, David Allen's thing. It's um, basically just like how to write a better to do list, and it, it's basically just getting everything out of your head and onto some sort of device or piece of paper, an inbox, he calls it. And so the idea being that your your mind is still for for uh, ideas for creativity to happen cuz everything cuz if we if we're like oh yeah i got to do a, i got to do something you don't write it down it's in your head you're a little afraid that you might forget it and that causes a certain amount of stress whether you know it or not um so this is like and and i mean out of that came children's hospital hmm. you know my mind was i i sort of it was very meditative um and then my daughter hurt herself. Uh, her pulled her. She had this thing called a hand hand nurse nurse maids, the handmaid's tail, the, the nurse <laughs> you maid's made elbow. That? I don't know. Uh, nurse maid's elbow, which is like a ligament, just uh -huh. just gets pushed out, and it's easy to fix. But we didn't know that at the time. We took her to the Children's Hospital, which is the least funny place in the world. And um, on the way home, it just kind of popped into my my head. So so wait, let me understand. So you would you would. Start off this morning, uh, each morning, making a to-do list of sorts. I would just learn. I would go on the internet and learn about how to make, because I'm a list person, I make a better to-do list, or at least in a grand sense, how to get more things done more efficiently. And what would you write down on a typical day? I promise we'll, we'll, we'll end in one minute. Everything. Absolutely everything. Like but you, you have do nothing a, to do. You do a dump. I know, right? You do like a, a a brain. You just dump your brain out onto a piece of paper or a, whatever. It was a Palm Pilot at the time, I think. Um, and anything, even things that you're not even sure you really have to do, just anything. Like I, I would just walk around my house and be like, I, I, I wanted to fix that table or. Uh, so, so putting these things down. I want to write this movie. Would make you feel less stressed. Mm -hmm. Even though the world may have been falling apart, may not have yeah. been, you didn't really know. You know oh, nobody really knows in the, in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And then that left room for the creativity of it's sort of like the, uh, Julia Cameron's free writing in the artist way. Exactly. So it lets like the cre creativity kind of come through somehow. Yeah. In the, in Which the I end. used to love. Like I, I loved uh, the artist way. Big, big uh, self help book. Yeah. Love it. No, it's great. And, I love and, it. And then Children's Hospital, you just sort of called up all your friends and like, hey, let's make a YouTube yeah. a web series. And yeah, that's what it was a real revelation for me. Like, why do anything with people I don't love? 
because uh, because it's going to be a recipe for success if um, you just get the funniest people that, who you love the most in the world and surround yourself with them. And then you know, in terms of my producing partners, they were the smartest people I knew as well. Like, and I think surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you is another recipe. Well, and and interesting too that you went ahead and did it. Uh, you said, "Hey, we could even just do this on the internet." Doesn't we had have that to was the only place we show. could too. And then it became a TV show. Yeah, and 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 also interesting in there is that you were able to bring in and motivate all your friends. Like you, yeah. you, you were, I don't know how many episodes of Party Down you were in, but Ken Marino is one <laughs> of the stars of that and Ken Marino's in Children's That's Hospital. Right. And it seems like like every little piece, like you were in a couple episodes of Arrested Development, one of my favorite shows. Yeah. You got Henry Winkler on Children's Hospital. That's right. And Michael Sarah does the, uh, did the uh, attention staff uh, announcements. Okay, yes. I, I didn't yeah. know that. And, uh, and it's, it's the whole thing's hilarious, but I guess that then kept you going mm -hmm. until yeah. Hot Tub Time Machine and, yes. and so on. very much so. Well, uh, Rob Corddry, this next season of Ballers is excellent. I really feel grateful that you're on, so I was get, able to watch the, the season in advance. And uh, They gave well, you the whole season? They gave, they, well, they gave, me, the, they gave me everything. That's so, pretty good. Yeah, they, they, there's a warning. Everything might change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's great. And, uh, uh, you know, good luck on this season. I hope you come back on the show. There's, I have like I a will, thousand man. more questions. This is so much fun. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thanks. Yeah, this was great. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.